Okay, well, good morning, Rich. It's good morning. Uh, June 26th, 2019, and I'm David Laws, semiconductor curator at the Computer History Museum here in Mountain View, California. And this morning we're going to talk to uh, Rich Prevett. Uh, Rich uh, worked in the Valley for a long time. <laughs> we'll figure out yes, indeed. as we go forward, but uh, certainly spending 30 years at Advanced Micro Devices. I think Rich has an incredible background that we look forward to talking about this morning. So. Welcome, Rich. Oh, thank you. If we could start off with a little bit about uh, your background, uh, Rich, and I believe you were born in Boston and raised there, was it? Yes, I was born in Boston, uh, 1935, which nowadays when I write that number down, it, it kind of reminds me when I was a kid that I was thinking about 1776. <laughs> you know? But yes, I was born in Boston, um, a son of, uh, of immigrants. Uh, my father immigrated from Italy in the early 1900s, and, uh, and my mother was born in New York City. And uh, we spent our time in Boston uh, through the Depression. Uh, and I was one of five children. I have three older brothers and one older sister, uh, one of whom still, one, one of my brothers still is, uh, is alive, so it's two of us. And uh, we uh, uh, were a Depression family, I guess, for everybody who was born after 1929. So it was uh, an interesting experience. Uh, it makes an impression on your life and how you live it, doesn't it? It does, uh, but I can't remember the effects of the Depression. I was too young, you know. I remember World War II. But I, after, you know, looking back uh, over my life, I think back the greatest generation really went back to perhaps those immigrants that came in at the turn of the century. Because what they endured, you know, through the Depression, not as tragic as the war, but in some cases, you know, people had ruined families, et cetera, you know. So uh, uh, my father uh, uh, worked in the steel mills when he first came and uh, fundamentally was worked with his, his body and he had a good mind. and. And during the Depression, uh, he worked for the WPA, which were building roads and bridges, which might be a good model for today, given our infrastructure. My mother was a seamstress, and, uh, uh, we, and I was in Boston till I was 12 years old, and then we moved to California. Can you uh, tell us anything about uh, schooling? Did you enjoy school? Did yes, I always direction? enjoyed school. Um, I was. Uh, public education throughout. Uh, started in the public school systems in, uh, in Boston. Moved to, uh, we moved to Fresno, California, down in the Central Valley. Uh, and uh, went to public schools there. And uh, then uh, after high school, uh, I was the only one of the five that went on to college. And uh, I can't tell you what the motivation was because, you know, it was just a working family, but uh, perhaps I was destined, and uh, spent my first year at Cal Poly, and San uh, Luis Obispo. San Luis Obispo, and uh, was a kind of a, uh, uh, a desire to be an architect. But when I got through that first year, uh, didn't particularly like all the the aspects of it. Uh, but a very good school for it, but. Uh, in my uh, sophomore year, I transferred to uh, San Jose State, and there I went on to get my uh, undergraduate and graduate degree in business. Okay. And graduated in uh, 1957. Any particular aspect of business? Well, it was I pr primarily I was in economics, uh, where but we had uh, not quite a minor, but uh, some of the specialty courses I took were in industrial relations now called human resources. Uh, and I enjoyed that, uh, but I particularly liked economics. And uh, so it was, it, was leaning, it was more towards the finance side uh, of business. And, uh, and that led actually to uh, my career getting started because I received a direct commission in the Army uh, as a finance officer right after that. So I went in the Army in 1958. Uh, so in 58, and you were in the Army, what, a couple of years? Three and a half years. 
Okay. Uh, it was in three and a half years, and uh, I was fortunate in that I was between the Korean and Vietnam Wars, uh, because at that time uh, we still had conscript conscription, uh, the draft, and uh, ironically, I was uh, I had a little gap between the time I was accepted in the army as an officer, and the time the schooling start. And so it came up that uh, my number came up down there in Fresno, and I got drafted. And when uh, I asked them to contact the Department of the Army, I was told, you know, the Selective Service System is a civilian organization, and we don't do what the Army tells us. So I was drafted in and spent my first six months at Fort Ord, and then Fort Bliss, Texas. And then one day I got called into the orderly's office, and they said, you've been commissioned a second lieutenant. And then I went off to school and then uh, spent most of my time of that uh, three years uh, in uh, two years in Hawaii. And uh, we were funding military assistance groups in uh, Southeast Asia. And I had mostly civilians working for me and I was a, as a finance officer. So that really got me started in the base of uh, being a, a finance executive. That's uh, pretty unique, Rich, in terms of uh, Army education being useful to you in your civilian career. Really was, even though the, um, you know, the system used by the government is almost like a single entry system and the commercial system is to double entry. Uh, I'm not, a I wasn't really an accountant but I understood the fundamentals of accounting. And, uh, but it was, it, it was, that's how it got started. Good. That's how it got Excellent. started. And when you came out of the Army, what was your first uh, really full-time civilian assignment? When I came out of the Army, um, uh, had, we had some colleagues that were in the area uh, from San Jose State, and uh, one was in human resources at uh, uh, Philco. In, um, in Palo Alto, and there... So this was the old Western Western labs? Development Labs, labs yes. yes. Okay. And uh, there the uh, uh, principal business was as a subcontractor to Lockheed, and uh, they had the, the subcontracts for the, some, the electronics and communications on the satellite dishes that were going on being installed around the world for the space program. And six months after I joined, uh, Ford decided they wanted to be in the electronics business and they bought uh, out the uh, electronics divisions of uh, Philco. So it became uh, Philco Ford Western Development Labs. Right. So I spent eight and a half years there. Uh, I started out as a financial analyst, analyst and working on, uh, on government contracts and we were uh, principally there to uh, account for the costs and for the contractual uh, uh, provisions and, uh, and then work with the government auditors to justify and certify the costs. And uh, then I, uh, it was interesting because when Ford came in, uh, they started instituting Ford uh, programs, I'll call them, and one of them was in the finance organization, which was very strong in Ford, and may still be today, but it was very strong then because it was a carryover from the uh, whiz kids who went to work for Ford after World War II, uh, led by Robert McNamara. And uh, what the importance of that was is that they maintained files on all the uh, MBAs in, in the Ford system. And indeed, back in Detroit, they had, once you, you, you joined, they had your file there. And they fundamentally kind of directed where your career was going to go. Not necessarily with local management, although they were closely with them. So, uh, and then that later became very important to me at AMD, which we'll, we'll talk about. But that also led to, I, I, I went to two other divisions after WDL. And um, along the way, I uh, was recruited by a controller in the uh, organization because 
uh, Ford then bought, I think it was General Microelectronics, GME. GME, right. And uh, that was an interesting experience because um, GME, I mean, Ford, what Ford did is the, indicating they're really serious about this. Uh, they recruited uh, some uh, high-level executives to run uh, what was then going to become the uh, Philco Ford uh, semiconductor operations. And there were a lot of discrete operations in the Philadelphia, Philadelphia area, and those were brought in under the umbrella. But GME was going to be the central part because it was in the IC business. Um, and they brought in John Welty from Motorola. And, um, and that, they moved John from uh, Chicago out to uh, Santa Clara. That's where it was headquartered. And I was recruited in as the financial analysis manager under the, under the controller. Um, and so the operations got started. And when they recruited John, they told John, uh, you know, this is it. This is going to be the permanent headquarters for all semiconductor operations for Philco Ford. Because John said, you know, I don't want to go to Philadelphia. I don't want to go east. Well, six months later, <laughs> Ford decided, well, we're going to shut down this GME and move everything out to Bluebell, Pennsylvania. And uh, John said that wasn't part of the deal and went back to Motorola. Uh, my boss, uh, the controller, went to work as controller of Singer Frieden across the, the bay. And uh, they offered me to go to Bluebell, Pennsylvania. I went back there, looked at it, and said, no, I don't think so. But here's where the system came into play for finance MBAs. Because then they said, well, we really want you to stay. And there's an opening for a finance uh, analyst manager in Menlo Park at, uh, it was Sierra Electronics Division, which was another division of Philco Ford that was making telephone or, or communications test equipment. They had line analyzers, et cetera. So I went up there and, uh, and, uh, and about a uh, year after that, that controller retired and I became controller. And so, uh, I was there uh, for about another year, and then, interestingly, uh, two former recruiters for uh, the old semiconductor division that I came out of uh, contacted me. One was uh, now doing recruiting for, at that time, Ernst & Ernst, and the other one uh, was Arthur Young. Uh, and they both call me and say, hey, we got an exciting position. Uh, there's this uh, startup, some other startup that needs a CFO. And it's a bunch of guys out of Fairchild. And we think you might be really interested in it. And after my experience at GME, because I stayed till we closed it down, and it was just an awful experience. I mean, it was, you know, closing down the operation. I was the senior finance guy there. Yeah, and I, I said, interviewed Phil Ferguson. Oh, of Phil, course. Oh, of course. Okay. And <laughs> Phil was full of stories. Oh, about my gosh. The, the it was full of them. Was. So I said, no. And I said, no, I don't. I, 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 I'm not interested in that business. I think it's a crazy business, <laughs> which was kind of interesting. So uh, then they persisted, and uh, they called back and said, look, you, you got to talk to them. And uh, I said, OK. And that's when uh, it was mid-1969. It was probably June time frame of 1969. And uh, they set me up at the interview with Jerry, and I came down here to do uh, the do DiGiulio Street. Uh, it was uh, there rented operation they had there and uh, I walked in there with my suit and my suit. narrow tie <laughs> and <course>. you know <laughs> white shirt and and uh, they said well Jerry will be right out and here comes Jerry he comes out and I stand up and here's this guy you know with a bosun shirt striped bosun shirt jeans long hair by probably not today's standards long hair long hair and sandals on I thought oh my goodness <laughs> you know but, you know, all you have to do is sit down with them and, you know, after 
three minutes, you know you're with an extraordinary person. And uh, I looked up at the board, and he had this black green board with chalk on the and it said, you know, get a CFO, you know. Learned that that comment was out there because the initial investor said, you know, we'll finish the money. As a requirement. As a requirement. You've got to have a CFO. <laughs> so, so Jerry and I went back and forth until around August. And then so did you have to interview with the funders at all? Oh, yes. I, you know, it was running the gauntlet because there uh, with eight founders, which I think today is still unusual, uh, it, was, it was important that everybody... Uh, talk to us um, and uh, uh, so uh, I did go through uh, all the founders but it, it was interesting you know because uh, the way the founding group came together was interesting and somebody else might have told you this story but it really started with the four fellows who wanted to start a linear business and uh, that was Larry Stenger, Jim Giles, Frank Boddy and Jack Gifford and so uh, they had operations, mar uh, marketing, engineering, two of them from operations. And, uh, but they were told, look at, you know, Linda, your business is not going to be something, you know. You, you, but first of all, get a leader. And so they approached Jerry Sanders, and Jerry said, you're not going to make a business out of this linear technology. You know, you need some digital bipolar technology. And so... Jerry uh, then con convinced uh, John Kerry, Sven Siemenson. Uh, so they weren't out trying to create their own company at that time? It the linear guys the were, linear guys were trying, but, but, but the not others the were not. Okay. And so then Jerry uh, uh, br uh, brought uh, them in and Ed Turney from sales. And that's, they got the group put together and uh, they all uh, decided that they would put up $50,000, $400,000. A couple of them had to borrow the money from Jerry, but, you know, they paid it back ultimately. But uh, that's how the eight of them were put together because Jerry said, yeah, we'll do that, but we've got to have a balance of products. Mm -hmm. and, you, and, you know, the digital age is upon us, you know, and uh, analog is fine, but, you know, We'll, ha we'll have a real business here. Little did we know business. how profitable the analog business would be 20 years down Little the road. Little did we know, you know, because it became a minor uh, business for AMD. Uh, and, uh, uh, but how did you feel about being the first non-Fairchild employee in the company? Well, it... Um, it's like walking into a fraternity and knowing nobody. It... It was, except that uh, the the atmosphere there was uh, uh, was was totally welcoming. I mean, they they were so enthusiastic and energetic. Uh, even though there were some who were not sure about me, I'm, I know that, and that's that's fine. They shouldn't have been because they didn't know me. I didn't have a track record there. Jerry and I had a chemistry that we could feel from the from the outset. We knew we had an understanding that, uh, you know, he had never been a CEO. I had never been a CFO. We we're going to do a lot of learning on the job. And uh, if we work together as a team that, you know, you know we could make this successful. Uh, so it wasn't very uncomfortable. I mean, the people, they were, you know, were all young and, and everybody felt that this looked like a great opportunity. So uh, it was just kind of unique that I stood out uh, when, as number 12. Eight founders, two, I mean, Gene Conner was number 11, right. and I think the mass designer, uh, uh, Donna Mellick, was number 10, and I was, uh, I was 12, so it was, a, uh, it was an interesting time, though. I mean, it really was. We, we had started out where it was always hard work, a lot of fun. Yeah. So what was the first thing you had to do when you walked into the company? Well, the first thing I had to do was sit down and create an accounting system in there, you know, because, uh, and it's interesting because I, this was all on ledger paper, you know, <laughs> and so had to set up a system of, uh, of uh, documentation and tracking and uh, getting the uh, procedures in place. And what was 
good about that environment in, in the startup uh, in, in that we, we were, seemed to all be committed that uh, no one would accept that's the way we've always done it. And we all had uh, a, an attitude that we were going to do it in a way that was better than we've seen it done in the past, whatever our discipline. And that made it interesting, exciting, challenging. And so it was a matter that, you know, we had to have uh, systems to account for payroll, for purchasing, everything that led to the balance sheet and the P&L. And so, you know, for the first time in my life, I was an accountant. And, uh, but I had a lot of help from, uh, uh, at that time, Arthur Young, uh, until they merged with Ernst and Ernst. And uh, they were really helpful in getting some of the basics put together for us. And, and uh, that was, and then it's a matter of documenting procedures and uh, uh, just like setting up a business. As uh, the first administrative employee, did you have HR and other activities like that? No, uh, because uh, that was a, um, HR and purchasing were assigned to one of the founders. He, the founders, uh, took on multiple roles, uh, like uh, Jack Gifford had HR, Ed Turney had purchasing. And that was a, um, for example, with Ed Turney, it was a perfect role for a sales uh, manager because he, he, tough know, he, you know, he, he was the toughest negotiator. And, uh, and that was a really complimentary role, believe it or not, because well, we weren't selling anything yet. We were buying and we we're uh, using the... Uh, Initial 400000 was used to uh, get a contractor to agree to build one, uh, 901 Thompson Place. So what was the funding, first funding for him? Well, first, of course, beyond the 400000 the first funding was $1.7 million, I believe, from preferred shareholders. And um, You were involved in raising that? Jerry, Jerry had raised almost all of it, but there was a remaining about a half a million that uh, uh, had to come in. And once Jerry had me signing on board, the rest of it was coming in. And so by the time I walked in there on the 2nd of September, 1969, the money was in the bank. And it was kind of a quid pro quo. I said, yeah, I'll join as long as we've got the money, but we need you to get the money. <laughs> but so it worked out. Uh, and I got to walk into a brand new building, a brand new office. And uh, Okay, so this was 901 Thompson Place? 901 Thompson Place was done by, that was the first day of operations in there. Uh, so that went up quickly. Yeah, it went up very quickly. Yeah, they... Uh, well, Turney could, I mean, he made things happen. I mean, it was, I mean, this was such an outstanding group. I mean, they, they, uh, they, they had uh, so much energy and uh, confidence that, uh, in what they could do and what they wanted to get done. Sure, mistakes were made. We all made mistakes along the way, but they were corrected quickly. You know, th that's where you found all the benefit of a startup. Uh, you know, the, the cause and effect was a very, very quick right. process, you know. So when did they build the first product? I think the first product came out in, I think, as I recall, like it was the AM 30, 9300. The 9300, 9300 Universal Shift Register. It came right. out in yeah. the fall, I mean in the spring, spring of 70. So about six months. Six months, yeah. And that kind of became the yardstick. You know, we want to get a new product out every six months. But meanwhile, we were developing what were the linear products, 102, There was some comparators yeah. and some op-amps, I think. Op-amps, yeah. Op -amps, yeah. And so, uh, but we had to also get, we had a fully integrated operation there because we went from wafer fab all the way through Mark and Pack, all in 15,000 square feet. And... Uh, and then uh, hiring the people, bringing them in. Uh, so uh, it was almost a seven day a week operation. And, uh, and we, uh, we were all were working a good 12 hours a day. And, but you know, it was, uh, we all had the energy and it was, 
it was just exciting. So revenue started coming in after about nine months? After about day? nine months, uh, you know, the first year revenues are pretty small because we were a March ending company, so we could, we had revenue coming in. I think around the second quarter of 70, first revenues are coming in. Uh, Jerry was successful in uh, getting Hamilton Avenet, well, Hamilton Avenue. It was Hamilton. Hamilton. Hamilton days. only at right. the time, you know, because uh, uh, hey, they were good friends, and I mean, no one thought we could be brought in by you know one of the the largest and not the largest uh, distributor, and uh, so that enhanced the situation. But uh, then, I mean, the team got going and products kept coming out, and uh, of course, it was our, I think. Uh, being a second source company, we had to have a differentiation, and our differentiation was uh, uh, what later was called the commitment to excellence, but we were going to build everything to mill standard 883. And uh, that, I mean, that was a selling uh, point to customers even beyond those who, you know, government contractors. What were your big biggest challenges during that first year? Well, I think the, the biggest challenges were uh, to keep uh, with, well, for, for us as a company, it was to stay within that small amount of money, million and a half dollars, to keep us going and, uh, and keep the resources going. And, and uh, it, you learn early on from a, as a finance executive that uh, it's cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. <laughs> cash is king. Right? Cash is king. So it was, a, it was interesting because uh, uh, we had to manage our payables very carefully. We had few receivables, so there was not a lot coming in. And so uh, managing the payables meant we had to keep a balance between maintaining our credit and stretching our payment cycles as far as we could. Uh, so that meant spending a lot of time, you know, uh, talking to uh, vendors on the phone and, uh, and then keeping, trying to keep our, our D&B rating uh, solid. So it was a balancing act, but that was, that's part of, that's part of startup life. Uh, then the other part was, you know, getting the products out, building an organization, building a sales organization, building a finance organization, bringing in people who uh, you know would contribute immediately and not uh, think that they could just you know rely on someone else to do the job. When you came into AMD, you had to hit the ground running yeah, because you were going to be in a job that had to be fulfilled immediately. Not unlike any other startup, I would guess, but you know, to us, when you're starting out, all of us coming from large companies, it was... Uh, it's a, it's a shock in shock, many ways in terms yeah. of you didn't but realize how much you relied on an infrastructure to take care of really things. Didn't, really did really did And you can't build up organizations faster than you can, you can afford them. And, uh, but we, we were very successful at continually bringing in really good people. I mean, the good people attract good people. And I think that just lasted for... It's lasted for the 50 years AMD's uh, been in business. Right. How quickly did Jerry pick up on the, the subtleties of financing a company and running a company from that perspective? I mean, he's a smart guy. I really smart I guy. I mean, I, 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 he he's probably the, has the most analytical mind that I've ever met in, in my 60 years or so, whatever it is, in business. Uh, absorbs, listens analyzes and comes out with you know good questions good challenges uh, and uh, you know he uh, and at the same time he's learning himself but it I think an awful lot of what we did in that time just came from the character that individuals had uh, for example I mean uh, I would point out that Jerry's of the highest integrity. I mean, and not that I'm saying anyone else isn't, but of the highest integrity, and you always knew that. And as a finance officer, that's extremely important. I mean, there was, 
we understood early on, you know, there were no, no uh, uh, shenanigans, so to speak, in, in the way we were going to do. We were going to account for it correctly and honestly and, and reported straightforward. Uh, but uh, again, I mean, we, we had to get in the mode where we had to make decisions and make decisions quickly. Uh, and, you know, I, I always live by the rule that uh, if you have to make a decision, uh, you can't be 100% sure. If you're at 75% confidence, go with it. Because, you know, any decision is better than no decision. Boy, you make no decision and then you never know what was wrong. So we, we, we learned that quickly. Plus, uh, Jerry maintained uh, a, a very good communications system. I mean, we had a weekly, we had what we called founders and officers meetings that would start at the end of the business day. And there, all the issues of the business for the week were put on the table by everybody from their disciplines. And so there was this, this active communications process, decision process that was started early on by Jerry. And, uh, and it was also useful in that people learned what they had to do. And they learned what their responsibilities were. They had to learn what their authority was. And we had to learn to work together. And, uh, that, and learn that about the, the different aspects of the business and how they interplay. How they interplayed, and, right. yes. Because for the first time, you know, many of us were, had to be uh, reactive to operations which we may not have been uh, associated with in our, in our prior uh, jobs. So that's, that's what, that was the, uh, the central process. And then, you know, every, then everybody, I mean, we'd go back to doing our jobs, but then that, that meeting was weekly. Uh, and we all had responsibilities, uh, general responsibilities across the, the company, like somebody was responsible for security for a week, opening and closing the building. One of the, uh, the nine of us had to do that. And uh, so uh, all that was just developed in real time. Good. How long did that first financing last, and when did you have to start worrying about finding uh, additional money? Well, we... We had to, that lasted, if I recall, be, up until we did what we called a, uh, an MOS financing of about $600,000. And uh, that was, and we did that, and I can't recall exactly when we did that, but it was probably in the 19, late 1970 time frame. And that lasted us until 1972 when we went public. And, uh, of course, today those amounts of money sound ridiculous. I buy one piece of equipment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, our founding money, we could buy, a, you know, perhaps a stepper, I don't know. Right. But, and so that lasted until we went public in 1972 and we raised $7.2 million. Tell me about the process of going public and what role you played in that. Well, the, uh, uh, the bankers uh, were uh, chosen on the basis of, you know, especially Jerry interviewing. And, and he had, uh, I had never been out to Wall Street in my prior jobs at Philco Ford. And uh, so Jerry had been out there making contacts when he was raising the money and the bankers would tell him to go see this organization, that new organization, all, all private equity sources. Uh, so he, had, he was familiar with some contacts out there. Uh, and then uh, in early 1972, uh, uh, we met with, uh, as part of it, we met with Donaldson, Lufkin, and Jen Rett. And uh, Jerry liked them because they were the first investment banking firm. They're, first of all, they were small, uh, was a really smart group of guys. Uh, and they were the first investment bank to go public on Wall Street. And so not only were they taking companies from the New York Bank, the New York Bank, and uh, and the, but they also went through the process themselves. And uh, uh, I remember we, we were also impressed when they they showed us what their mission was and the their principles of their mission. And the last one was have fun. 
and we could think of nothing better than to, you know, to adopt that same idea on our mission statements. Have fun. So um, we uh, we chose uh, DLJ, and uh, then we start putting the story together along with them writing the story, uh, and uh, uh, the bankers along with uh, you know the other founders. Uh, and we created the uh, the prospectus, writing up the story. We had I had to, you know, develop the projections, work with the bankers and the accountants to work up the projections, and uh, uh, develop uh, the uh, the structure of the uh, uh, financials of the prospectus. So uh, we had uh, the support of directly from. Uh, Dick Genret, uh, one of the principals, one of the founders who was head. And that's where we first met uh, Joe Roby. He was the investment banker assigned to us. And ultimately, Joe became a member of our board and ultimately actually became head of DLJ uh, many years later. Uh, and so uh, uh, we uh, worked with the bankers to uh, set a time frame. Uh, and uh, develop a, uh, uh, a use of the fund statement. What we what we were going to do? How much money were you looking for? Well, we we raised seven million dollars, seven point two million, seven and a quarter million, and uh, it was what five five hundred thousand shares at fifteen fifty. I think was the price. So we netted seven point two million, and uh, and so that. Uh, uh, was our our funding uh, to uh, to really get started in in the public marketplace, and uh, somewhere along the way I can't remember where it was, but you know we were we were in a meeting and I recall with, with uh, it was a staff meeting and several of the founders are still on there, and. Um, we were watching the cash very carefully. Well, we were burning cash, you know, and uh, I remember the founder said, well, gee whiz, are we, uh, you know, a couple of the founders said, we're worried, are we gonna run out of money, you know? And, you know, and uh, are, we go are we gonna go bankrupt? And Jerry looked at me and I looked at Jerry and said, well, we're not, we're, you know, we're not gonna go bankrupt. And Jerry said, yeah, Rich, yeah, we're not, right? I said, sure, we got $6,000 in the bank. We're okay. <laughs> but we were, we, were, we were never close to that brink. Uh, uh, we, were, we always found a way uh, to, uh, to finance the business. And once we started generating revenues, uh, uh, we, we found a way to, uh, whether it was debt financing, uh, we and uh, and just manage the cash flows, uh, but we we were never in a position. I don't think that we were uh, concerned about opening the doors the next day. Yeah, up I mean, to that point. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> sure, just, sure. Yeah. So seven million dollars in '72. Um, the market had rise and falls during that time in term, or the, the the economy rise and falls. And then there was, a, there was a big, big problem about 1974. 1974 was a uh, watershed year. <laughs> when uh, 1974, you know, the the market really uh, 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 dried up. I mean, it was a recession year, and uh, and so uh, and we were getting inundated with uh, distributor returns. Up to that point in time we were accounting for distributor sales when we sold it to the distributor. And, uh, uh, our pro and we developed a, a, a methodology of uh, reserving a certain amount of those sales uh, on the balance sheet uh, based upon probabilities and, uh, and we worked that out <laughs> with with the auditors, and so it wasn't uh, it wasn't a uh, it wasn't a uh, uh, a method that they they disapproved of. But there was an alternative method, which was to only record 
the sales when the distributors resold. So uh, uh, the auditors convinced me and, and then I had the task of going to convince Jerry that we were going to have to, you know, really adopt this and take this not typical of his character and integrity said, if that, do you think that's the right thing to do? And he thought about it and thought about it carefully and I said, yes, I think not only that, I think it'll be a competitive advantage in the long run and then that's what we did. So it, it was a, that was a tough year, uh, but we made it through and, uh, and we, we adopted the, uh, the sell-through method and maintained that up until I think and I'm not sure of this. I think just recently, or in the last year or two, they've they've kind of changed that accounting rule. I, right. I think they have. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but they changed it back when, and then the industry fundamentally followed it. Right. I remember yeah. Intel did it fairly early on. Yeah. I think. Yeah. And so it 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 became fairly fairly widespread. Sure. But and that really eliminated a, uh, uh, a contractual process that. Uh, while the distributors were limited to, a, I believe, a 5% uh, of their prior year's um, purchases uh, on returns, that wasn't practical. Not if you wanted to sell some products next year. Right. You know? <laughs> and so you had to be practical about it. Uh, so uh, that was a big survival. I mean, we went through a number of recessions after that, but. I think that was probably our biggest challenge. Yeah, I think I joined on. in middle of 1975, just as you were coming out, coming out of, of that 74 yeah. recession. Yeah. I remember Jerry saying that I was very brave to join the company then. <laughs> Jerry, I didn't know how bad it was. <laughs> no, it was. But you know, uh, in 1972, I mean, we had made our commitment to, and we built out Penang, Malaysia. It's our first back end plant which was a courageous move to begin with, but you know, we felt we had to have our own back-end operation. And, uh, and, and, and then Penang became an incredibly successful operation long-term, our first one. So, uh, but we were able to put those things in place, uh, you know, and uh, uh, as well as uh, building Fab 2, and then in 1974, we made the commitment on the 915 building. We bought 25 acres in Sunnyvale, just down the road from Thompson Place. And, uh, and that was the um, Technology Development Center, I recall. We call that uh, the 915 building. And then the bipolar business began to become less important as MOS? grew in the marketplace? It, it did. Bipolar di did become less important. However, uh, we, uh, uh, we did uh, pursue bipolar on, on into uh, mid-70s because I uh, uh, can't recall exactly, but we wanted to build a bipolar facility in Gilroy. And uh, we got approved, and uh, it was uh, uh, ready to go to contract. And uh, someone on the council decided, well, maybe just to be sure, let's put it on a referendum on the Gilroy ballot. And when they said they were going to go to a referendum, Jerry said, hey, we're not going to go up for a vote. You know, this isn't a vote. You, you already approved it and we're not going to do that. And uh, as part of our process of looking at sites, San Antonio yes. was considered and we decided then that was it. And uh, we committed to San Antonio and turned Gilroy off. It was unfortunate for Gilroy, pro probably long-term better for us, right. even though- Right, got you into Texas. <laughs> yeah, it got us into Texas and, uh, and, and we had bipolar Operations were there run down by Bob McConnell down there, but right. ultimately... And Clyde Barton initially. And that, that's and right, Bob. yeah. Did, how, how was that funded? Out of uh, revenues? No, that was funded out of revenues. Uh, although, and I can't recall exactly, I'd have to go back and look. We, we did some borrowing during that time. 
and I can't recall exactly all the all I, all the borrowings that we uh, we we did along the way, um, but we had a good balance of equity and debt, so that the balance sheet was was always good and solid. Uh, later, when we got in, you know, closer to the 80s, we had some, uh, 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 you know, we went with with some public notes that were in the 11 percent range, which were pretty expensive, but. I think, you know, I harbored the, uh, the banker's view on the, on the debt that, uh, you know, debt was always cheaper than equity. When you start diluting the shareholders, it becomes permanent. And uh, if you're confident in your business and your cash flows and the market will soon come back, you can, uh, you can pay that debt off, which ultimately we did. But uh, we used leverage. Uh, enough, but not to where it, I think it damaged us. Sure. Now you were on the board all during this time. No, Rich. No, no. no. Your, your title was. My title was uh, was uh, well. When I started, was director of finance, and then we started giving vice presidents. I was vice president and chief finance. I was always, but I was always director, chief financial officer, and treasurer. Then became vice president, chief financial officer, and treasurer. Then ultimately, it was senior vice president, chief financial officer, and treasurer. Uh, but not on the board, but I attended every board meeting, except for closed sessions. But I attended every board meeting as, uh, as CFO. Jerry wanted me at all the board meetings. And 99% of the time I made the financial presentation at, at board meetings. Yeah. Uh, I, didn't, I wasn't elected to the board till I was made president in 1990. Okay. So all these how how was a typical board meeting? Were they pretty much uh, in uh, agreement with Jerry as to where the company was going and what should be done, or were there any major decisions to be made that were tough? Well, I think that, first of all, you know, as long as the CEO is in charge of the board, the board is going to be fairly compatible. Uh, not that is necessarily without challenges. Jerry always picked, I mean, people who were uh, intellectually uh, uh, superior, I think, and who had backgrounds. He wanted them to make a contribution. They, he didn't want just voters on the board. Now, make no mind that Jerry's a strong personality, and uh, when he wants something, uh, he would probably get it. but. When he wanted something, it was for sure that it was something we needed. It wasn't, you know, something that was kind of off on the periphery. So he had a great deal of confidence of his board. So uh, I believe that uh, with the disciplines that were represented, uh, that we, had, we always had a balance board. We had finance backgrounds, we had engineering backgrounds, we had academic backgrounds. We had you know, banking backgrounds. Uh, but keep in mind that in 1977 that we uh, sold 20% of our equity to Siemens. And that gave them a seat on the board until sometime in the 80s when they sold their, their holdings. Uh, so we always had, uh, generally it was the head of the semiconductor operations for Siemens was on the board. And, uh, and, and so Jerry had some insight into the business from a, bit, a larger company, albeit, you know, it was a European company. Uh, so, uh, and I think Jerry always maintained good relations. He kept his board members informed, always did one-on-ones to keep, you know, throughout the year besides the board meetings. And uh, uh, Jerry's a, just a good listener, uh, but when, he disagreed with something, I mean, he let you know it. And he let board members know it. Uh, so, um, but, you know, I think that uh, uh, throughout our careers there, I think uh, we were fortunate to have some very, very good board members. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the organizational things that Jerry set up was basically product line oriented, each with its own resources, manufacturing, marketing, 
sales, or not sales, but uh, other, other support services. Um, and at one point in time, there must have been eight or ten different product lines. Did you see them competing with each other for resources and any battles over that? Well, there, there were uh, there were several product lines, uh, and I, 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 first of all, I, I think that structure was very good for us because <clears throat> I think that the, the, the uh, channels of organization built around product lines was extremely important during that phase of the industry because many of those product areas were, were developing. W during the, what I would say, the first 10, 12 years of the business, it's pretty much dominated by the semiconductor industry saying, hey, we've got these products, customers. You've got to go design them and use them. I mean, if you don't use these, you're going to be competitively disadvantaged. Of course, that eventually started changing to where the customer said, this is what we want, and this is what we need. Meanwhile, as the industry was developing, as our company was developing, we had that product line so that it was, there was no reason why it shouldn't succeed. Other than if they said, well, we don't have enough of a bite of operations or their attention, but they had marketing, they had product development, you know, they had design elements. And so they had the, the head of those divisions, so to speak, had the resources necessary to get the job done. Conflicts would often come, you know, when the, when the wafer allocations were made. And, you know, and so depending on which fab you were using, um, you know, the division manager uh, was in there uh, wrestling for, for uh, a spot. And in those years up until John Kerry left in mid-'80s, uh, you know, John was the arbiter. And... Uh, and, and Jerry was the ultimate arbiter of it, uh, wherein he would make his decisions based upon how it fit into his strategy. Jerry was always the strategist, always. And, um, and he should well have been. I mean, there's, he was just brilliant, how many times, brilliant on his market outlook. So these, these silos, so to speak, of business units, were, I think, a, a very good foundation for the development of ultimately how we came out in uh, serving the market uh, with product areas that survived. Of course, along the way, uh, uh, we uh, uh, cast off a lot of these product lines, but my gosh, we had <laughs> we had a 64-bit RAM and. <laughs> <laughs> went up into flash memory, and we had communications products, and some of which we probably should have kept, but, uh, you know. But some that we divested, I think, made a lot of sense uh, in terms of uh, being able to allocate physical financial resources. Into the late 70s, early 80s, AMD became notorious for these big parties that the company gave to reward the employees. As a finance person, did you have any reservations about the money that was being spent on those? No, no, never. You know, uh, people first, profits and products will follow. Products and profits will follow. Uh, I, I really, I really subscribe to. Uh, and later on, when I became COO, uh, I really understood it. I mean, as CFO. I understood it uh, because uh, I grew up with the people. We, we all grew up together in the organization. And those associations started with some of the, I mean, all the wonderful, uh, this is not racist, the wonderful Filipino ladies we had on the line in, in the 901 Thompson place. And they were, I mean, so diligent. Not the others weren't, but I mean, they brought in so many. They were familial, you know. And we, once we had this core, the people they brought in, we knew it'd be good because they wouldn't let someone come in who's not going to do their job. But that, and the fact that, you know, um, we were in the 901, 902 business when uh, 
Jerry gave out something like 250 shares to the first 100 or so employees, all the way to, to the line. And so uh, I felt that giving back to these employees in the form of entertainment and the fun part of our mission statement was proper and right. And, and uh, uh, I don't think at any time that it reached the point of being non-affordable. If we didn't think we could do it, if we didn't, if we thought the time wasn't right, we would just postpone it. We did that. We yeah, had Christmas, Christmas in May. Christmas in May right, one right, time, so, I remember that. So, right. so uh, no, it was well spent. The employees, I mean, they just thought that was, you know, the best uh, feeling uh, of management, uh, you know, appreciating them. Yeah, it's certainly you couldn't have purchased the kind of PR that came out no, of that no. in terms of uh, good feeling toward no. the company. And look at what it's done in the Valley. Now, you know, uh, Salesforce.com, and I don't know if Apple does it anymore. I mean, they have these huge uh, employee appreciation uh, you know, functions, and, you know, I think money well spent, and I don't think the shareholders, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, disagreed with it. Your transition to COO, Richard, tell me about that. Well, that was interesting. <laughs> Um, in 19, I think, well, 1987, you know, we merged or we acquired MMI, depending on which side of the ledger you're on, uh, which was a good one. That was a good one. Really, MMI was as close as uh, any other company in, in terms of the character, the nature, the spirit of the company and the people. Irwin was running a terrific uh, company. And so that all came together and, and we, we integrated that. And, it, and Irwin and I were designated as the integrators to integrate the companies, et cetera, and do that. And uh, so and through, through all that, I learned a lot from Irwin as his experience being, we were CFOs at the same time and then he became CEO and so I learned a lot. He's a brilliant fellow. I really admire Owen, one of the wittiest and funniest guys I know too. But you know, so working together and what we wanted to do with organizations and people and, and the importance of certain people, uh, I learned a great deal because subsequently, uh, Irwin stayed about a year, year and a half, and subsequently, uh, we realized that we had so many redundancies in the operations, fabs, back end. Both of us had huge operations in Penang that something had to really be done and done well uh, or we were going to have a real problem. So during that time, um, uh, we, uh, we had Tony as executive vice president, COO, Mr. Jerry. Tony Right. And uh, and Jerry as CEO and, and I was senior VP and CFO treasurer. Um, and Tony had decided, uh, you know, that he really wanted to do something else. Uh, and so uh, we, uh, it's probably no secret that you know we were out uh, looking for a. Uh, a COO, and uh, along the way there, uh, uh, where we either didn't have any takers or or, or we didn't have uh, candidates that we felt would fit, uh, I sat down with Jerry and said, you know, Jerry, uh, you know, if no one else wants to do the job, you know, I'll be your arms and legs and I'll do the job, and you you be the strategy and I'll make it all happen. And he looked at me and said, yeah, hmm, well, let me think about it. And he came back to me about three or four weeks later and said, okay, you know, what we'll do is that you'll become COO, but Tony will become chief technical officer and we'll form an office of the CEO. And so that's what <coughs> we did initially in uh, 
I think it was the uh, summer of 1989. And, uh, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, Jerry said, well, you know, if it all works out at the next annual meeting in 1990, uh, you'll become president, COO, and a member of the board. I said, that's fair enough. Uh, and so uh, we did that, and it work, worked for a while, and uh, there were times when I felt I needed a little more room to move on decision-making, and uh, so then the office of the CEO was dissolved and Tony wanted to go off and do bigger and better things. And uh, then I uh, became president, CEO, and board member in 1990. Um, and uh, the challenges I learned along the way is because uh, I would, uh, I would, well, first of all, let's do. Let's put it this way. After MMI came into the fold, we wound up with nineteen, almost nineteen thousand employees. Uh, and you know, um, we had a, you know, a a shirt that was pretty small for the body at that time. <laughs> and it was very, a di very difficult task because it meant uh, that we were gonna have to uh, close a lot of facilities. Most of Santa Clara had to be closed. I mean, there were three different fabs. We're gonna have to close down some, one of them in Penang. And, uh, and this involved a lot of employees. And uh, so uh, I had started out uh, just after I became COO, and I started out and went to Jerry because it was a very difficult year, 1989-90. Uh, and I said, well, you know, uh, I felt that we had to do a 10% reduction in force, but that 10% reduction in force had to come from the salaried because so many times you do a layoff and you get all the clerks and the and the you people. don't save much money. Right? Don't save much money, yeah. and then they all get hired back because they said, "But oh, I need another clerk." I said we've got to save ten percent of this payroll, not ten percent of the people. Ten percent of the payroll. So we did that, and that helped. Uh, but then uh, we had to go through the, all the operations. So. What I did was, uh, I went to Jerry and, and said, you know, we've got all these employees here in Santa Clara, and we we're just starting up the SDC. I said, what I want to do is, I want to screen the employees over in MMI and our own fabs, and then find the best people based upon the screen that the, uh, the ops people put together. Take those people, train them in the SDC, that's the Submicron Technology, Sub-Micron Technology, Technology Center, which were all next level jobs from where most of them were coming from. I said, then we're going to have a lot of surplus people, but I said, I, I want to put together a pool of a million dollars and that we would offer to these people training in various other areas around. We would, they could go to Mission Valley College, they could go to beauty school, they could go to anything that, you know, go to a technical school, and we would pay for them to go to school to retrain out of these jobs that'll never come back. Because, you know, once those old, you know, the, once those old fabs went away, automation phew, took, took those jobs. So um, I spent uh, uh, about a month going around to all these operations, and so I'd have to go to the three shifts. So you know, pizza at midnight and pizza at five in the morning <laughs> was kind of interesting, but I had an opportunity. I'd sit down and I'd make a presentation. To these people. Then I'd sit down at the table and eat with them and listen to them and talk to them. And, and once you, you express an understanding and an empathy for the situation they're in and explain to them what you're doing, uh, it, it's, 
difficult but accepting on their part. And that, I learned a lot from that in terms of, yeah, should always, I mean, people first, always, and don't lose touch. And later I would uh, do that by implementing uh, a way to make sure Texas and Sunnyvale were all together by, uh, I, I did uh, lunches with Rich, and I'd invite, I'd have HR invite eight to 10 randomly selected employees at all levels. And I'd have a brown bag lunch and say, tell me, tell me, tell me what's going on, you know? And I did that over a several month period and it was a great learning experience and it, it put me into appreciation of- It's a, it's uh, a tough task. A few yeah. sleepless nights along the way, I imagine. Oh boy, so you know, so that decision process uh, was a, you know, it was a battle hardened, so to speak, you know. How, uh, let's see, 19,000 employees, roughly what were the revenues at that time? The revenues at that time, we actually had reached $2 billion. $2 billion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two, $2.1 billion. Um, and, um, we, uh, you know, it, it was $2 billion, $2.1 billion. And uh, when, we, when we finished all the um, uh, redundancy, actions, we had 12,000 employees. Okay. So it was significant. Big drop. It was significant. Big yeah. drop. Yeah. Now, there were a number of spin-outs of product lines at AMD over this period, Vantis, Spansion, others. What, what, what was going on there and what was your involvement? Well, yes. I mean, we, um, of course, the MMI operations became Vantis and uh, uh, and we still, uh, besides the CPU operations, we had uh, uh, the NVM, non-volatile memory operations, which are EEPROM and flash memory. And uh, so, um, uh, Rich Forte, is, he was CEO of Vantis, and he was reporting to me. And uh, uh, I had Wally McGreeby, he was running non-volatile memory. And then we also had uh, all the uh, communications products division uh, running. And uh, so decisions were made that uh, uh, we uh, uh, wanted to sell Vantis. And, uh, and that was the programmable logic business. Programmable mission. logic to, you know, business. And uh, uh, we ultimately, uh, we talked to two or three different interested parties, but he ultimately sold them to. Uh, um, yes. <laughs> Lattice. Lattice. Lattice Semiconductor, uh, and who, who was, it was being run by a former MMI executive. Uh, and, uh, uh, and they, uh, they bought it um, probably for about a quarter of a billion dollars, if I recall. Um, and um, so um, that we sold just before I left. Um, we were shopping the communications business around um, and um, uh, Ashbrook. He was, he was heading that up. Uh, but uh, before I retired in, uh, in 2000, I think it was January 2000, uh, neither of one of those were, uh, were spun out yet. Neither non volatile memory or, uh, or what ultimately became legerity. Legerity, yeah. Um, so, um, after I retired, I uh, uh, joined a, a small startup that was in a B2B type situation. Ran that for about a year and a half and then it got caught up in the, the great 2000 crash. That was the market fusion? Market fusion, yeah. Right. So we uh, liquidated, we didn't bankrupt, we liquidated and uh, so then I went into my second retirement. <laughs> um, 
And then in, uh, I think it was 2005, I got a call from uh, uh, Hector Ruiz and uh, wanted, he said we wanted to uh, know if I would come back and help them uh, spin out the memory business. So uh, I went back to AMD, uh, I went back as an officer, uh, executive vice president, chief administrative officer of then what they called Spansion. Uh, it was run by uh, uh, Bertrand. I'll think of his name too. Anyway, he had come from Motorola and then was at that time, after Wally had left, was running non volatile memory under Hector. And uh, Hector, I mean, uh, uh, Bertrand Cambu is his name. And so uh, uh, I worked under him and uh, and uh, helped him spin it out, and then uh, uh, we took it public. And uh, by the, you know, I think it was by the first part of 2006, we took it public successfully and spun it out, and then I left there in, I think, like April, March or April, then went back to retire again. Uh, and then, uh, Around 2008, I believe, Hector called me again and uh, said, "You know, we we're gonna we've decided we're gonna uh, go fabless, spin out spin out the fabs." So, uh, having learned a lesson from the Spanchin experience, um, I said, "Yeah, I'll come back, and I'll but I'll come back as a consultant, you know, to pay my pay me a fee." Uh, and you know, and I'll be responsible to you and or Tom McCoy, or whoever is you know head of the. And that's when uh, uh, we did the uh, sale of the fabs to uh, Abu Dhabi and the Mubadala uh, investment arm of the Abu Dhabi government. That was a really interesting, I thought, a re very rewarding experience. Uh, had some. Uh, brilliant people working for me as a small team and uh, what, what we did is really construct uh, you know how to dissect an organization that was you know it was almost it was almost like taking conjoined twins you know apart you know and where are the vital organs you know how do you reconnect the vital organs and so uh, is this what became Global Foundries? Global Foundries, yep. And uh, we, uh, it took us about 15 months. We spun it out and uh, along the way AMD stock was doing this and it always made for you know, the decision process. But we ultimately got it all defined and constructed and built the model and what would go here and what would go there. And uh, uh, I had two outstanding young ladies working with me uh, on that. Uh, one was the former chief of staff to, to Hector. Uh, now Hector had succeeded Jerry as Hector CEO of the company. Hector had succeeded Jerry, Hector yeah. Ruiz Hector Ruiz came in from Motorola? From Motorola, yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, anyway, that, that was done successfully. But yes, Hector, uh, when I retired, there was a, um, a brief tenure of uh, the one acquisition I didn't mention, which was NextGen. Mm -hmm. And NextGen was brought in to enhance our ability to do the K6. And uh, uh, the, uh, the organization was brought in and the CEO of that organization uh, became my successor uh, as president, and I think he stayed. I think it only lasted about three months. That was Raza, Chief Raza. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Only about three months, and then he went off and formed his own company. So there was a void, uh, and uh, that's when Jerry uh, recruited Hector in from Motorola. 
and Hector brought in some team members. That's when some, you know, some Motorola people start coming in. Mostly in 2000, 1999 to 2000, yeah. And I had been, I had stepped down and was actually uh, vice chairman of the board, um, uh, which we all know is the desk next to the door. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so you just, so, uh, but that's okay. I mean, it was timely. Um, uh, I think my advice would be to people who follow a path, uh, uh, a similar path in, in, in businesses, uh, don't stay too long, you know. And I, I think uh, it's, uh, it's best to uh, recognize when it's ready to be ready and go. So anyway, it was those two assignments were really uh, fun assignments. The last one, especially working with the staff of AMD, and then with Mubadla and Tom McCoy was there, and uh, uh, that was that was a that was a fun time. And the uh, and it was a, it was a good it was a great success. I think it was, uh, and I think seeing what Mubadla sold their stock at not too long ago, I think. It finally worked out for them, um, and Global Foundries is independent and on its own, mm -hmm. on its own now. You know, so uh, uh, that so was good. So, what do you do with the time in retirement? Rich? <laughs> well, uh, most of it uh, is trying to figure out where my time goes. <laughs> you know? Don't know how you had time to work. Yeah, right? <laughs> along the way, it, it's interesting. Um, some uh, for about three years, I think between 2008 and 2011, I had probably one of the best experiences of my career. Uh, I was recruited to the board of Kimonda. Kimonda was a spin out of Infineon. That was a spin out, semiconductor oh, spin out Siemens. of Siemens. Right. And Kimonda was the DRAM company. And uh, uh, the uh, they uh, uh, sent the uh, former CFO of Siemens uh, to chair the uh, Kimonda supervisory board, and uh, Peter Fischel, outstanding, really outstanding fellow, and uh, he recruited me in to come on the board uh, of Kimonda, and because uh, they wanted to take it public. And uh, I joined the board, I think it was in 2008, as vice chairman. And uh, that was a very interesting experience. I learned a lot about governance there because the German form of governance is very different than board governance in the, uh, in the US. Uh, it convinced me that my attitude today is that uh, uh, all public boards, I think all all boards, for that matter, should be non-executive chairman. Um, I think that it's okay for the CEO to be on the board, but um, I think just based upon how that operated, because the supervisory board had no executives on it, and that gave them a very distinct power over the management board. But the management board couldn't be on the supervisory board, nor could the supervisory board be on the management board. So it's very clear distinction in German law. Now there might be some other kinks in German law, but the way that operated, I thought was very good. Uh, it, it basically spells out your your the guidelines, if you will. I won't call them limitations on the authority and responsibilities of those respective boards in running the enterprise and staying within the legal structure. And uh, that was a very rewarding experience. We took Kimonda public. And now Kimonda was located all in Germany? All in Munich. That, in Munich. Well, they, no, I take it back. In Munich, but we also had operations in, oh, where was it? It was on the East Coast. I'm not sure. It might have been North Carolina, but, but the primary operations were uh, in, in Munich. Right. And... Um, uh, that was uh, that was that was uh, that was a lot of fun too. Le I learned a lot, 
had a great board, small but great board, very international board. And uh, I'd recommend that any person who serves on a board in the U.S. sometime or other go serve on a European board. Okay. A lot to learn, a lot, a lot to realize in terms of, of, uh, of uh, experience. Rack up a lot of airline miles too, yeah. I imagine. Yeah. Oh yes, oh yes. Yeah, I, I really did. Uh, sometimes, I, I, I also, towards the end of it, I, I was chairman of the audit committee and sometimes, a couple of times I had to go back with you know, like a three-day trip because an audit committee meeting, and that's all there was, was an audit committee meeting with the auditors. And, but you just you endure it. You know, we've endured worse than that. So, sure. But it's a lot of fun. Any activities outside of um, these business activities? Uh, any uh, charitable organizations? Or Not anymore. Boards, I was on a like lot that? of charitable boards during my tenure at, at AMD. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on the, uh, it was called NCCJ then, but that was uh, National Conference of Christians and Jews. They changed that, so I was on that for a long time. Served on that together with Erwin Fetterman. Uh, I was on the President's Council at San Jose State for two or three years. I was chaired the Parkinson's Institute uh, Foundation Board for several years. Uh, and I chaired a, uh, a committee where we raised uh, six million of $16 million to refurbish the uh, business school building at San Jose State. Okay. So that was, that was fun to do. Uh, and, uh, but uh, after a while, uh, uh, I was also chairman of the board of a winery up in Sonoma that uh, I was on for up until 2008, I think for probably seven or eight years. Um, that was fun and rewarding. Get, got paid in wine. <laughs> so, uh, but now uh, Cindy and I uh, have spent uh, our time enjoying our house and then traveling a lot. We like to travel. Did you have any kids? I have two boys. One is in Los Angeles. He, he's in the entertainment business and I have another one who's a software engineer and just moved to Orlando, Florida with a, a company that's in the uh, LIDAR, li yeah. LIDAR uh, business. Uh, automobile right? uh, ranging. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah. And he's really excited about that. Mm -hmm. He's really excited. So they just arrived there this last month. Okay. And uh, so, uh, and he has one daughter and granddaughter and my son in Los Angeles is a uh, still a bachelor after one attempt at marriage. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a committed. So, uh, uh, how did you find the challenges of being in the business and being a father? Oh, uh, they're very different. You know, uh, uh, being in the business uh, generally, when you get home. Uh, you know, you're kind of away from it. Being a father, it's 24-7. You know, <laughs> you worry about them all the time. At some point in time in business, you learn that you have to shut it off in order to to keep your your wits about you. And albeit that might have been some narrow, narrow hours, but fortunately in, in our experience, I mean, being with AMD, and then these after AMD experiences, uh, they've been uh, they've been very uh, uh, pleasing and rewarding. And staying in touch with the people is as important as anything in that. Sure. And uh, and now having gone back to see some of the people uh, on the 50th anniversary has been. Uh, well, you've stayed in touch with a lot of the AMD yes, alumni yeah. ever since you yeah. left, right? Yeah. There have been the, these annual meetings or Christmas parties yes. and things yeah, like that. Yeah, the, 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 the alumni are really, really rewarding. You know, it's, uh, uh, I should mention that one of the most gratifying parts of my career at AMD is, is looking back and then also seeing how many uh, of uh, our graduates have gone on from my 
finance career have become CFOs throughout the valley or elsewhere. Um, one of my former uh, finance executives, Jeff Rebar, said, you know, Rich, he said recently uh, he counted at one point we had 30 CFOs out of coming, have coming out of AMD in the valley. And then when I start counting the CEOs, I mean, look at the, the people we've had. I 150 mean, or something is the number yeah, that I saw recorded recently. Just and incredible. Sure I mean, you know, uh, some people you've interviewed, George, uh, Jeff Tate, um, and, uh, um, you know, people who, and uh, Tony's been kind of CEO and chairman of s several organizations, Tony Holbrook, uh, uh, Jim Downey, uh, John East, uh, uh, Andy Pease, I mean, just, it just goes on and on, you know. And uh, Jack Gifford, one of the founders. Uh, uh, John Kerry, one of the founders. Uh, so I, t I take a lot of pride in what AMD produced beyond just the AMD experience. What we brought to other companies, and that means that many more employees who benefited from our executive experience passed on to them, to their business success. That's very gratifying, very gratifying. A lot of people remark that AMD might not have been the most financially rewarding place they've ever worked at, but it was the most satisfying in many ways. Mm -hmm. I believe that, yeah, I believe that. Um, when, when, you know, when I uh, look at flames and I uh, read the new people come on and say, gosh, it's nice to reconnect. Uh, it's hard to remember all the names because who knows how many people we employed over the 50 years. I, I tried to think of an algorithm to <laughs> calculate it, but uh, I think that uh, it's in the tens of thousands for sure. Uh, but they do say that and, and fairly consistently, and uh, I, I like that. Uh, you recently attended a 50th anniversary celebration for the company, mm -hmm. and you spoke to the employees there. Uh, tell me a little bit about that meeting and what's going on at AMD now. Well, that was a very gratifying experience, I have to say. Uh, it was uh, to see uh, that in that setting. First of all, it was here in Santa Clara in the new building, uh, having moved out. Uh, and it was so nice to uh, be invited by Lisa Sue, the current CEO, outstanding CEO. Um, I, I don't mean to demean anybody, probably the best since Jerry. Uh, and that's not degrading anybody along the way. Um, but there uh, in that, uh, that meeting room, uh, uh, where she brought in a couple of hundred employees and then she invited, we had probably 75 alumni there. That was the first time, I mean, in a long time since, since uh, Jerry left, that I felt the spirit in the room. You could feel the excitement. And that's the first time that's been brought back. And it has to be Lisa Sue and her team uh, because that's what it takes. I mean, in the five years she's, she's, she started there, in two th I mean, she became CEO in 2014. I mean, you look, at, you look at the chart and it's upward and to the right. But what's marvelous about this lady is she does what she says. Uh, and as she pointed out in that meeting, you know, after being questioned by Jerry, she not only will do it, she guarantees it and she did it. And so she has AMD on a path uh, now to uh, you have to say Intel's on the ropes right now, uh, at least in the CPU arena. Well, I, I, well, they're not in the in the GPUs. I mean, that's where AMD competes with NVIDIA. But uh, you know, I told those people when I walked in, and I saw all those young faces, and I said, "It looks like my grandchildren," you know. <laughs> but it was it was so satisfying to see that, and to uh, and to tell them that uh, you know. AMD is a family. AMD is a family type organization, and as evidenced by these 75 people that were there, you never you never lose it. You're always part of it. It never goes away. You always have that feeling, and uh, and I think that uh, 
uh, Lisa Sooner team, especially, I have to mention Devinder Kumar, the senior VP and CFO. Devinder, we hired early on, you can think it goes back, he was the controller of Penang. And uh, then Marv Baquette, who was my controller for a number of years before he ultimately became uh, CFO of NVIDIA, he brought Devinder back to the States and put him in executive positions in finance ultimately. Here he is, you know, senior VP and CFO, brilliant young man, I mean just terrific. And I think Lisa Sue and, uh, and Devinder make an incredible team. And then, yeah, CFO, CEO, that team's got to be in lockstep, and, it, and it's happening. And I think, there, I think there are some really great things that are going to come out of that company in, in the next several years. Um, and uh, it's really nice, you know, to, uh, uh, to feel proud again. I'm always proud of AMD no matter what they're doing, because they're always in there in the fight. But it's more proud today being what they've accomplished. Yeah. It's good to hear, Rich. Good to hear. Now you're off on a new adventure. You sold your house in Saratoga. Sold our house and, and uh, giving up the congestion. <laughs> I think it took me 15 minutes to get in there from the freeway, just, just from the corner. Uh, no, uh, we're going off to Fort Collins, Colorado, where Cindy's family is. It's a, a nice town, home of Colorado State University. We have a more than one acre spread there on a beautiful craftsman-built home that we remodeled and um, re-landscaped, and uh, we're going to see Four Seasons now. Good. Yeah, we're looking forward <laughs> to it. It's, Great. You know, it's going to be a little different. There's 160,000 people plus 30,000 at the university, so it's just under 200,000 people. And, uh, you know, a traffic jam in there, six cars lined up at a stop sign, you know. So it's, it'll be a little adjustment, but it'll be a simpler life. Okay, well, if someone would, one of, let's say one of your grandchildren was coming into Silicon Valley today, do you have any thoughts on career recommendations or how they could take advantage of uh, the entrepreneurial atmosphere here? I think I would tell them that um, it's never too late to take a risk, first of all, uh, as many of us did in 1969. Uh, with young families. Uh, it's never too late. And I think that they should look at the opportunities here, uh, not as uh, a career necessarily from the outset, but just an adventure. An adventure for your life uh, and to make it uh, with good balance with your family uh, and to make it a learning experience. Uh, and if you're fortunate enough as we were back in the 60s and early 70s to be in a pioneering env environment and clearly as evidenced by this museum you can see the pioneering start here into what it is today that you have more experiences of fun and challenge uh, than you could ever imagine. And more great people to meet uh, and people from all over the world now. It's a really great experience. I would then also encourage a young person coming here if they get the opportunity to get international experience, take an international assignment learn about the rest of the world. Europe or Asia, it's, it's great. Okay, well, thank you for spending time with us. Rich, any last advice or <laughs> suggestions for us? Well, I think that uh, uh, today's technology companies are very different than what we are 
You know, ours is a seminal technology. This is not, again, a degradation or criticism, but the current companies are media companies in so many respects that I wonder, and perhaps the museum will point the direction, where's that next step function in technology going to come from? I don't see it yet. And how wisely will we apply artificial intelligence and all the other things that are coming out Indeed. Of, the, of the valley? Indeed. So huge questions and huge opportunities. Opportunities with challenges. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and rightfully so, the challenges today are more social than they are, you know, business uh, mission wise. You know, I think it's the social impacts are dramatic. I have to say this and we don't have to include it, but you know, there are times when uh, I watch the news, a lot of which I turn off. There's times when I watch the news and I think about where there is an integrated circuit as I'm watching this. And I say to myself, what have we created? What have we created? Because it all started Right here. It all started right here. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'm Thank you so much for doing this. That's a pleasure. Thanks for joining us, Rich. I appreciate it. And oh. good luck with your move and settling into Oh, we'll into stay a, in touch. We'll be coming back. Okay. And, uh, and um, in fact, we were going to bring my nieces down before they go back, but we'll have to bring them out another time. I want them to see the museum. Good.